What's going on, YouTube? Please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Big thanks to those who already have, as we just crossed 17,000 subscribers. We love to see it. FBT is up next. What's up and welcome in to Fantasy Baseball today on Thursday, March 9th. Frank Stanfield joined by Scott White and Chris Towers. Today on the show, we've got a loaded one for you. Scott's Tout Wars recap. That is a 15-team 5x5 five five Brodo Industry League. We'll be recapping that. My NL only labor team. We're going to recap that one as well. 12 team salary cap slash auction. And then later on, we'll have players we haven't talked enough about with a special guest here on the show. But guys, let's just jump right in because we have a lot to get to. Not a lot of time to do it. We'll start off with Scott's Tout Wars team. He was picking 15th overall. I've got the draft board pulled up for those watching us live on YouTube. I'm gonna, yep. You got to scroll left to right, though, which is unfortunate. Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to be able to show all the picks, but people just want to see yeah. your team anyway, Scott, so that's all that matters. Let's, uh, uh, let's first preview what this draft is. It's an industry league. It's been around for a long, long time. It's one of the longest standing industry expert leagues out there. Uh, Tout Wars, 15 team mixed, 5x5 five five Roto with OBP instead of batting average, standard Roto lineups, two catchers, one of each infield spot, middle infield, corner infield, five outfielders, one utility, and then nine pitcher spots with six reserves. Six, six reserves, Scott? I don't know if that's true. Five reserves. It is, uh, yes, six reserves because it's uh, 29 rounds. And if you happen to be viewing the video, uh, I, I want to point out real quick, Jansen Junk shows up there as a pick <laughs> made in round four. That's not actually Jansen Junk. That is a placeholder for the pitcher version of Otani because Tau War splits Otani into two players. Well, yesterday I teased that both you and Chris drafted Fernando Tatis in your respective Tout Wars teams. Scott, you're picking 15th overall, and you went with the Padres stack. Fernando Tatis Jr. and Manny Machado at picks 15 and 16. Is that yep. what you were hoping for? Uh, and do you plan to place yes. a piece at outfield, shortstop? What do you think? Oh, outfield. Because that those were the positions I wanted to fill in rounds one and two, outfield and third base. And um, I, I knew... Like third base was the most important of all because uh, obviously it's a high priority for me in every draft this year, but especially a 15 team draft like this, and especially one that uses OBP instead of batting average, because if it uses OBP in, in, instead of batting average, then that pushes Alex Bregman and Max Muncy up even more. You're, you're already inclined to reach for them after the stud third basemen are gone but especially in that format. And sure enough, Alex Bregman went in round three and Max Muncy in round six. So I, I probably wouldn't have been able to get wrap my head around taking them at that point. It just would have happened. I had the choice of picking anywhere from eight to 15th. I figured if I pick eighth, uh, my only hope for a stud shortstop was to reach for Nolan Arenado. And I didn't want to reach for him that early. So you I decided stud third baseman. Cause you said stud third baseman. Yes. Um, so I decided 15th gave me the best chance of pairing, uh, of getting one of those stud third basemen with my first two picks. And I hoped Tatis was who I could pair him with so that I would have that stud outfielder still. Obviously, the the seven that we talk about um, as, as surefire first rounders would have already been gone by that point. Mike Trout probably would have been gone by that point, and sure enough, he was since it's an OBP league. So Tatis was who I was hoping for to pair with any of those third basemen. I did go with Machado over Devers this time, in part just to diversify. The rate, the margin between them is so thin, but in part because it is an OBP league. Machado walks a little more. Devers' biggest advantage is batting average. Kind of neutralizes that advantage. Hopefully, Machado will give me some steals, and he's in a better lineup. So I went Machado and Tatis there, and uh, and that was kind of it for for game planning for this draft. <laughs> because as I've talked about... When you pick at the end, and especially when it's a league as big as this one, uh, you can't anticipate too much what's going to make it back to you. you. I had to wait 28 picks before every pair of picks that I made. Uh, and, and, and you know, any time, like even once we were already made it through that those first 14 picks and we're on the way back, I'm looking at players like, okay, th maybe this guy will get to me. Maybe this guy will get to me. And, I think one time the whole draft did the guy I hoped would get back to me actually make it to me. So I was kind of just taking who, whoever came to me 
um, and really uh, not not sticking to my like obviously not sticking to the tiers approach that I normally use when drafting because again you can't anticipate what's going to be there and that's what the tier approach is so it was really just about being comfortable with what's given to me um not reaching so much to fit a player into my prescribed plan and i think i did a good job of that i think most of my picks ended up being relative values uh i the the time i was most tempted to reach came early so um Okay, so my first my first two picks, as you pointed out, Fernando Tatis, Manny Machado. My third pick, obviously, these third and fourth picks were made back to back. Ozzy Albies, which I, I wasn't necessarily looking to go outfield, third base, second base in this in this uh, particular draft. Albies' value isn't as good in an OBP league, and in a deeper league like this, I, I don't know that you need to treat second base like it's so scarce because it's 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 a bottom heavy position. Uh, there's a lot of talent available later is what i'm saying uh but it you know i I was hoping like kyle schwarber would make it to me in round three he didn't so i went all these because that just was the best that was the best player available i thought uh and then i thought about going corbin carroll there because i really wanted to get that second outfielder and since it's an obp league i pointed out the other day i'm I'm starting to feel more optimistic about his on-base ability specifically it would have put me in a really good spot for stolen bases, really good spot for outfield, but it would have been a pretty big reach as the 46th overall pick. So instead I decided to play it safe with Shane McClanahan. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's hard to say how much that would have changed my draft if I went Carroll there instead of McClanahan. But with the draft being complete, I can say that outfield is my most concerning position. Uh, and and maybe we could get into that more in a little bit. But, um, you know, obviously I'm counting on Fernando Tatis there. He's not going to be there for the first three weeks. And as things currently stand, I'm going to have to turn to the waiver wire for a replacement. Yes, yeah, Scott, I was, su- out. I was surprised that you wound up with uh, Shane O'Mac with your pick here. Uh, at your pick, the first pick of round four, which would have been 46, and you took him over Corbin Carroll. And I think the way that the draft played out, the top pitchers available at your 5-6 turn were Zach Gallen, Tristan McKenzie, Robbie Ray. I think you did good. I know typically you like to wait on starting pitcher, but man, to get Shane O'Mac there at the 3-4 turn, just the way that all the pitchers started to go after that, I, I think you, you did a pretty good job with that. Uh, winding up with him there right and it's worth saying 46 is probably around when scott's taking his first pitcher it's just because right. it's a 15 team league that ends up being the first pick of the fourth round where in the 12 team league the first pick of the fourth round would be 37 overall i, I mean lately i've been taking my first pitcher more like beyond the top 60 uh I've, I've been pushing it back more and more and i hoped to do it in this draft too because i you know, the deeper the league is, the scarcer hitting is going to be. And I, I think that is the between hitting and pitching. It's more important to fill hitting in the early rounds. And that becomes even more dire in, in the deeper the league is. So I, I'd hope to go at least four pitchers to start the draft. But again, Pitters. I just had to take what was given to me. And uh, with McClanahan still on the board, Carroll, it just seemed like too big of a reach. Now, when it came back to me, Luis Robert was there. So I did get that second outfielder, one with health concerns, which also isn't great for my lack of outfield depth. But, it, you know, even in an OBP league, you can't complain about Luis Roberts' seven, 75th overall. So I had yeah. a lot of picks like that where it's just like, uh, all right, if, if everyone else is going to pass on him, I guess I'll take him. And and so up and down the draft, I, I see a lot of value there just from a pure... ADP perspective, you know, but did it all come together to create the most balanced, well-rounded team? Mostly, yes. Like in terms of category distribution, I I think it did. And what helped with that was that three of my first five picks were contributors and steals, Tatis, Albies, and Robert. So I didn't have to really stretch at any point to, to, uh, 
address that that category scarcity. I had a lot in the bag early on. Uh, what also helped with it is I had the presence of mind following that Robert pick in round five. I paired him with Rysel Iglesias, first pick of round six, which is probably the earliest I've drafted a closer this year. But I knew, you know, one of, one of my biggest problems in this league the past couple of years is just being too cavalier about saves and then having to cycle through a bunch of junky pitchers to help in that category. So as we've talked about in the relief pitcher preview and everything else, I want to get one of those nine that I feel really confident in, in them getting 30 plus saves and Iglesias is among that group. And sure enough, before it got back to me, as it was, as we're going through those 28 picks in round six and seven, um, a man, uh, let's see who all went. It was, uh, uh, hang on here. I got it right in my right up here. Okay, so Ryan Presley, Ryan Helsley, Felix Bautista, Clay Holmes, and Camilo Duvall all went before I had another chance to pick. So I would have been in a bad situation uh, at closer if I hadn't taken Rysel Iglesias there with the first pick of round six. So, so it helped that I addressed those two most stressful categories early enough that that, that kind of put me in a position where I could continue to take what was given to me rather than uh, having to reach to meet a specific need. So in, in terms of category distribution, I think it worked out well. Uh, you know, if, if I went a little lighter on power than I like early, that helped. It, it helped that uh, I was able to get Salvador Perez with uh, at the end of round seven. I think it was the 105th overall pick. Yep. Um, so, you know, he's going to give you a lot more home runs and especially RBI than the average catcher will. Um my second and third starting pitchers were Nestor Cortez and Chris Sale, which is in a league this deep, not uncommon for me. Shane McClanahan's a better ace than I normally get, uh, but I like that top of the rotation fine. Uh, Tony Gonsolin, who it does sound like he's going to start on begin the year on the IL now with that ankle injury, but it, it you know there's no fracture or anything. It doesn't sound like it's going to be a long term issue, and he slid all the way to 195th. So I got him as my number four starter. So my, I, I feel like my pitching staff for a 15-team league look, actually looks better than it normally does. Um, but because I was taking what was given to me, there is that issue of I just kept getting screwed out of the, the outfielders that I would have liked. So in round 11, uh, at the round 11-12 turn, I was gearing up to take Lars New back to the back. And they were there, and they were there, and they were there, and who was it? Scott? Was who was it? Excited to liked, take them. Scott, you lagged for a second. Who was it? It was, it was Lars Newbar. It was, it was Lars Newbar and Jordan Walker. I was, gotcha. I was prepared to take them at eleven, twelve turn, and and they were there and there, and suddenly they weren't there anymore. And so, who did I end up taking there? Oh, I went with the very boring combination of Hunter Renfro and Daniel Bard, which was fine. <laughs> But obviously, and, and I did get an outfield, thankfully, like Hunter Renfro, it's hard to get excited about taking him. But gosh, if I didn't have him with what ended up, how the outfield ended up playing out, I would have been in a really uh, desperate situation for sure. And then the other instance of that happening was in round, at around 1920 turn. I was geared up to take Garrett Mitchell and Jake Freely back to back. And again, it was the same thing. It looked like they were going to make it to me and then suddenly they were gone. And so I ended up taking, again, I took one, I took Trey Mancini, um, but I paired him with Craig Kimbrell. So Mancini ended up being my fourth outfielder there to go along with um, Tatis, Luis Robert and Hunter Renfro. My fifth outfielder is Alex Kirilov, who, of course, is no safe bet to stay healthy either. And those are the only outfielders I have on my team. So, uh, yeah, so it, I'm going to be turning to the waiver wire for at least one in Tatis's spot to begin the year. And, and there are some guys out there who are at least in line for regular bats. They might not be the greatest at bats, but, you know, they, they won't be a zero for me. But that's that's probably my biggest regret of the draft is that I wasn't able to build any any outfield depth to speak of, uh, and I'm just glad I got the ones I did when I did. Yeah, one thing I really liked, Scott, that you you broke down there was 
how you hit all the categories pretty much consistently throughout your early round picks. So again, and I think that's a really good point for people who either play, I mean, even 12 team Roto, but any type of Roto or even deeper Roto leagues, when you build a balanced roster early, you don't have to reach for specific uh, categories throughout like the middle rounds of the draft. It, it, it gives you a little bit more freedom, more flexibility to kind of play with some picks and maybe do things differently or, or take certain players that you wanted because you didn't have to worry. Yeah. Oh, I need to get power or I need to get speed because again, I think you did a really good job with your, uh, your yeah. five picks or so just the, loading up as um, on a lot of power and speed early. The one thing I think you're likely to be short on and it's hard because it fluctuates a lot from year. I do think OBP is going to be an issue yeah. for you. I think this is a better batting average team, which obviously makes sense because you got Salvador Perez and Luis Robert and, and Ozzy Albies probably lower than they normally would in a, an average league because they're right. better in, in an OB or in an average format. But like looking at your team, Tatis and Machado are good players in any format. They're going to be 360, 370 OBP guys. But like Albies has been like 310 the last three seasons. Salvador Perez, obviously always pretty mediocre in OBP. Luis Robert, I think the thing with him is like he's not going to walk a lot, but if he hits for the average that people expect him to, he's going to have a decent OVP. Like yeah. that's the one that actually like I think probably falls too far in this mm -hmm. format. Him going to seventy five, and and I, I'm probably a little lower on him maybe than than most, but like him falling to seventy five in an OVP league feels like one just a little bit of a misunderstanding of his skill set. Like you don't have to walk a lot to have a useful OVP. You just have to have a good OBP. If he hits 290 like we think he can, he's going to have a fine OBP. Albies doesn't walk a lot and is probably going to be a pretty mediocre batting average player. So he's been a, a pretty big drain on OBP. But, you know, that that I think is is the one weakness. But as far as like the counting stats, I, I think you're you're really solid everywhere. Yeah, no, I agree. And it's it's. It's hard to it's hard to manage OBP. I feel yes. like because when you consider the players who are actually good at at on base percentage relative to ones who are good at batting average, it's it's much less, and they tend to get pulled up a lot yeah. in this draft. And I'm just not not willing to go there usually, mm -hmm. um, particularly since the the ones who are perceived to not excel at OBP slide so far. It's just hard for me to reconcile that so i i try like like a you know it, it, it's a slight thing but machado over devers in round one i i try to make sure at least with my very earliest picks that i yeah i get a little obp i i would have you know it would have been great if i kind of got aaron judge in round one instead of manny machado yeah or, or, Ron, I, or fernando tatis would actually I, I would say like a yandy diaz who i ended up taking i i have no interest in him and in, in my standard leagues but I did take him in Tout Wars, which is my league is also OBP. And that was one. I think he went 242 overall. You took Ezekiel Tovar yeah. just ahead of him after taking Cattel. You took Cattel Marte and Ezekiel Tovar. Yeah, I, I mean, like th those were two of my favorite picks too. So my favorite stretch yeah. of picks was the third beginning with that Gonsolin pick um, at the beginning of round 13. Uh, it was Gonsolin, Miguel Vargas. I got him in the 14th round of this league compared to 12th round in TGFBI. And, and he might actually be pretty good in OBP. He's, you know, he yeah. should be good for average and, and walked at a good rate in the minors too. Uh, Cattell Marte should be pretty good in OBP if he's healthy. Ezekiel Tovar, you know, I, I think he has a chance to be a five con category contributor in Colorado. And I, I probably needed a few more steals at that point. Um, and, and if he does, you know, hit for a good batting average, then the OBP, should be pretty. regardless of the walk rate should be uh, pretty solid. And um, look, Anthony Rendon could end up being that guy. Like yeah, if Anthony, I did get Rendon Anthony Rendon is fine, Rendon then it's probably not going to matter as much because he should be a, a high OVP guy. It's like just 380 to 400. 400 yeah. Potentially. Yandy like Diaz is a like locked in 390, 400 yeah. OVP guy. And so that that's one that like, if, if you have a weakness, it's that. So, and, and that Anthony Rendon pick in round 18 to be my corner. I mean, part of it was just corner infield was starting to look pretty ugly. But mm -hmm. if it wasn't an OBP league, I, I wouldn't have gone Anthony Rendon there. Yeah, it, it was it was partially just the hope that he would help address that that weakness of my team. And if he stays healthy, he should. I guess I know. Um, but 
otherwise, if it was a standard Roto League, I probably would have just taken Garrett Mitchell there and not uh, crossed my fingers that he would make it to me with the next pair of picks. Uh, I did want to um, jump back to the point Frank made about... Um, uh, remind me what the point was you made, Frank, again, when you the last talked. That, the point that I made was giving yourself power and speed uh, yes. power and speed yes. early allows you flexibility throughout the middle rounds of the draft. Yes. And to illustrate this, I want to look back real quick at the way the same draft started last year. So uh, the winner was Mike Gianella of Baseball Prospectus, and he was a runaway winner. He won by like 13 points. His first 10 picks, if we could go through them real quick. Corbin Burns. Okay, that's fine. Max Scherzer in round two. Yeah, that's fine too. Whit Merrifield in round three. Ooh. Randy Orozarena in round four. Okay. Joey Gallo in round five. <laughs> the big whiffs on two of his first five picks. Carlos Correa in round six. Okay. A little yeah, fine. Early. Yeah. Christian Yelich in round seven. Same thing. Just kind of. Mm. You Darvish in round eight. That's fine. Will Smith, the reliever in round nine. <laughs> Big miss. Ryan Mountcastle in round 10, pretty bad pick. So three huge misses in his first 10 picks. No amazing picks. And then Ryan Mountcastle was a pretty lousy pick as well. Okay, so that was his, the runaway winner. My first 10 picks last year, Vladimir Guerrero. Okay, Zach Wheeler. All right. Austin Riley in round three. Can't, good like, pick. That's good. Sandy Alcantara in round four, even Great better. Pick. Great pick. Jose Altuve in round five. Shoot, he's going in round two now. Great pick. Ryan Reynolds in round six. That's fine. Charlie Morton in round seven. Okay, that's the first kind of shaky one, but not a not as disastrous as some of Gianella's. Justin Verlander in round eight. Amazing. Adalberto Montesi in round nine. Okay, that's the one big miss. And then Shohei Otani, the pitcher, in round 10. So I had one miss in my first 10, one kind of miss in my first 10. And then, like, three amazing value picks. I finished eighth of 15 <laughs> teams. And you know why? I, I, was, I was trying to look back through this, figure it out. I mean, part of it was just because I, I, I picks 11 through 29 were so bad. I had, like, one decent player there. But part of it is because as great as those picks were, not many steals to speak of and certainly no saves. So yeah. I wasted so many at bats on crappy hitters who I thought might get me steals like Jorge Mateo and so many innings on crappy pitchers who I thought get, might get me saves like Tanner Scott that I undermined a lot of my strengths there. And I, I actually had like somewhat similar issues in my Tower Wars league where I, I finished dead last in stolen bases, which it's actually like not that big of a problem because the team that won finished third. So like, you know, you can still do well. You're going to be bad at something, but yeah, I had somewhat similar uh, outcomes. So like, rather than suffer through that again, and I, and I just, I hate, I hate doing this because like, you know, you, you, you think better players means better team, right? Like it, it's just, you know, certainly in a points league, that would be the case. Um, but because, there, there are those those real specialized skills that are weighed evenly to all the others in a roto league. Um, you, you know, addressing them early with players who definitely deserve to be in your starting lineup, but they happen to contribute saves or steals, and then not having to, you know, not not having to just like waste lineup spots chasing those categories. I, I think especially for a roto league this deep i i think it's a better way to build it and so hopefully i won't have that same problem my problem this year is just going to be staying healthy i mean I, I talked about Luis robert and um fernando tati's not being available at the start of the year uh alex kirilov having health issues anthony rendon i mean even carlos correa uh and, and then beyond that, some of my upside picks later, guys, we already know are going to be on the IL, like 
like Lance McCullers and, and Trevor Story. There is an actual IL in this league, unlike TGFPI, which helps a heck of a lot. I wouldn't and have taken Trevor Story in TGFBI. But there's unlimited IL spots too, so you can take advantage yes. of that. So yeah. love it. Yeah. So I, I I I will be I won't have to like, oh, do I drop this guy who can be a big help later on so that I don't take a zero in my lineup? Like that's not going to be a consideration, thankfully. Uh, because I could just put him on the IL, pick up somebody new takes place. But we are entering, you know, one of the problems I had last year with that great start and still finishing eighth. <laughs> Gonna talk about the juice ball era again. So the 15 team roto league is something fairly new. Like I didn't play in a 15 team roto league until we were the juice ball era, like when it was first getting started. So basically my whole time playing in that format has coincided with the juice ball era. I don't have much experience with it before that. And since the main change with the juice ball era was a uh, wider distribution of home runs, deepening the hitter ranks overall, I think um, it was easy to approach it, to approach the late picks like really selling out for upside. And if it didn't work out, you know, there are a lot of redundancies at hitter and you could fill in the gaps with a boring player and, and be fine. But now we're on the other side of that. And it might make more sense, you know, just again, comparing my team to GNLs last year. Um, it might make more sense to treat a 15 team Roto League much like an AL and NL only league where the hitting is so scarce that you can't, you, you can't afford to miss that much. And, and so, you know, if you're pursuing upside too hard, even if it's later in the draft, uh, you're going to end up, um, you, you're going to have a hard time keeping up in those counting stats. And, and this actually played out with my team last year. I was the number two team in home runs. I was the number four team in stolen bases, but I was fourth to last in RBI and right in the middle and run scored. Like it, that doesn't feel like it should happen. But, you know, a lot of my um, a lot of my lineup spots were going to, to hitters who just didn't have a very high floor uh, for all those great options I got early. So um, even though I went pretty heavy on upside late in this one, uh, I was conscientious of getting players who I knew would be in the lineup every day if they were healthy, like Cattell Marte, like Ezekiel Tovar, like Trey Mancini. Um, I made even more of an emphasis than that. Um, put even more emphasis on that in TGFBI, but uh, you know, and, and I was still able to get some upside plays late. But you you kind of have to you kind of have to keep feeding the the uh, counting stats while you still can. I think in leagues this deep, twelve team leagues, another story. Ten team leagues, great upside uh, once once all the quality players are gone. But you know, fifteen team leagues are are uh, more on the deeper side of the coin. Yeah, and I think that's a credit to what Mike Ginella did last year. I know he wound up with a lot of players from rounds 11 through 29, which were probably viewed as just kind of boring, safe guys. Maybe they don't have crazy upside, but they played a lot. I know you highlighted some of those on Twitter, Scott, and they they gave you, it doesn't even have to be excess value. They just need to give you value. You know, They need to pay mm -hmm. off their spots. And I think, again, that's where the comparison between a deeper mixed league and an AL NL only comes in where you just kind of want some of those, not all your picks, but you want some, you want some boring guys that are just going to give you plate appearances and help build up those counting stats. So something to keep yep. in mind if you play in deeper leagues, but Scott's right. You play 10 and 12 team leagues. You really want to swing for the fences in those middle and late round picks. Let's take a break. And when we get back, we'll hit some news and notes and talk a little bit about my NL only labor team here on fantasy baseball today. You need to know what you're getting into. This is not cops and robbers. The enemy is everywhere, but he can't be seen. Why me? None of this makes sense. It's a mind game, John. What have you gotten me into? I can't tell the difference between what's real and what's not. Welcome back into Fantasy Baseball Today. Let's quickly run through some news and notes. Uh, and we will start with Andrew Painter has been has not been told surgery is needed on his ailing right elbow. Sounds like he'll need some time to heal, however, which means Belly Falter is the favorite for the Phillies' fifth starter job. 
which we expected on yesterday's podcast. Stalling Marte is set to make his spring debut on Friday. Marte required surgery in November to address separated tendons on both sides of his groin, but he's made steady progress and should be ready for opening day. Jacob deGrom could make his Cactus League debut as soon as Monday. He's been working his way back from left side tightness. Joe Musgrove threw on flat ground Wednesday, but did not land on his left foot. So both feet were just planted where he was throwing. I guess it was more just like a you know, keep your arm loose type of exercise. He, he was not wearing a walking boot today, I think, for the first time since the, the injury. Uh, yeah. Hey, positive steps. We'll, we'll take that with uh, with Joe Musgrove. Felix Bautista is on track to throw live batting practice next week. He's been rehabbing both a shoulder, uh, both shoulder and knee issues. And as long as he could work his way into one or two spring training games, which he hasn't done yet. But if he does that, then he should be good to go for opening day. Tony Gonsolin's left ankle is still swollen, but x-rays revealed there was no fracture. Dave Roberts said he, quote, doesn't feel good about Gonsolin being ready for opening day which Scott mentioned earlier. And I guess that would mean one of Michael Grove or Ryan Pepio is in the rotation to start. Do you guys have a lean on one of those guys or which way do you think the Dodgers are going? I mean, I'd rather be Pepio because there's actually some upside there. And I think he's looked pretty good this spring. If I remember, if I'm remembering my box score review correctly, but I don't know which way they're leaning and I don't imagine it'd be for long anyway. All right. Oswald Peraza is expected to return to game action Thursday. He tweaked something in his lower left leg last week, but seems to be okay. Justin Turner will probably be out two weeks after getting hit in the face with a pitch. He needs 16 stitches on Monday. Opening day could be in doubt for Justin Turner. Leody Tavares is going to miss a couple of weeks with left ob- with a, a left oblique strain and won't be ready for opening day. The team has already ruled out prospect Evan Carter making the team, so he will start in the minors. And let me quickly pull up the Texas Rangers roster resource page. I don't think that there will be much value with whoever fills in, but you never know. Uh, all right, so... Ah, uh, well, actually, yeah, Bubba Thompson. If you yeah, play- Bubba Thompson would be the... You play in a deeper categories league. I mean, that dude is fast. So, like, he's he's going to steal some bases. Definitely a name to pay attention to uh, in deeper category leagues. Bubba Thompson filling in in center field for Leody Tavares. Pirates prospect Tamar Johnson will miss six weeks with a strained right hamstring and just a few performances of note. Scott McGuff walked one but struck out three. Who? Who's Scott McGuff? That's spelled M-C-G-O-U-G-H. He's part of the... Very large Diamondbacks bullpen by committee. We don't really know what's going on there. Uh, but he struck out three in his relief appearance Wednesday, Wednesday. He's thrown four scoreless innings so far this spring. And I kind of feel like he's going to get the first save off for the Diamondbacks. I don't think anyone knows for sure. He had 69 saves over the past two seasons in Japan. And good thing it's spring training. Get it out of the way now. Dylan Cease. Did you guys see this line here? Oof, bad. He was charged with 11 earned runs. Seven hits, four walks in less than an inning of work in his spring training outing on Wednesday. So, I mean. Making up for all those unearned runs last year. Like the correction. It it all came on. I thought the same exact thing. (laughs) It all came on March 8th. Sounds sounds like a bus candidate to me. Oh, there you go. This is why spring training matters now. Just just kidding, obviously. Uh, Michael Massey hit a grand slam uh, and he stole a base. So, spring training sock in the shoe, Scotty. We'll take that. Uh, Massey. Massey already has three home runs in the spring, though I believe he fouled the ball off of his foot and then he left the game. So hopefully everything's all right. But By the way, th- this sock and a shoe thing is gaining traction. Have you noticed? I- sure I've is. seen people making reference to it. It is. W- without making reference to us. Like it's just part of the baseball vernacular. Let's and, go. Uh, I got to say, like a little credit for that one. I was denied credit on John Means Business. <laughs> that became a whole meme that I think I started, but like nobody wanted to give me credit for that. I think I, I think I need a little little credit for the old suck in a shoe. I, I'll give you credit for it, Scotty. I know uh, John Legesa on Twitter. Uh, he tagged you in a tweet saying that he he believed you were the one that that originated the sock in a shoe. That's for he a home run accurately. A home run and a steal in the same game. I tried to go with sweet and savory for a while, but people were not having it. So. Uh... <laughs> Quickly pitch that. Let, before we get into my NL labor team, we'll, we'll just quickly talk about that. Um, CBS Sports Fantasy Baseball Commissioner lets you run your league your way with endless ways to customize your scoring, rosters, schedule, and more. 
With CBS Sports Commissioner, you can cut out the loopholes and arguments and play exactly how your league wants to. My longest running keeper league, Scott White Dynasty League, they're both played on CBS and they run seamlessly. You can set up custom rules, roto, head to head points, or categories, salary cap or snake draft, keepers, contracts, draft pick trading, and multiple matchups per period. The league history is unlike any other fantasy site with a record book, all time standings, year by year results, and more so step up to the big leagues this season visit cbssports.com slash fbt to get a special offer when you start a new commissioner league today again that's cbssports.com slash fbt let's take a look quickly at my no only labor salary cap draft that i was a part of salary cap also known as auction draft first and foremost doing an auction in person fantasy baseball auction is the best it there is nothing better than that in fantasy it is so fun they're bidding wars poker faces there's egos one like there's cadence in terms of bidding there's so many different strategies if you have the possibility to do a a salary cap auction draft in person please do it because it is fantastic and I absolutely love it. 12 team league, $260 budget. This was also a standard standard roto lineups with batting average instead of OBP. Again, if you're watching us live on YouTube, I've got the uh, draft board up. So, on so, so the standard batting average, not yep. OBP. Okay. Just yeah, making yeah. sure you, yeah, I think that's what I said. Batting average. Instead yeah, you of, did. You did. Yep. Um, and there's a unique roster rule here with labor that just quickly need to mention. You can't take a player out of your starting lineup. Unless they either wind up on the IL, they get demoted to the minors, or you drop them. So if a player is active, you basically need to keep that player in your lineup. And look, in an AL or NL only league, the waiver wire is going to be pretty awful. So once the season starts, I can't just take any of my bench players and put them in for somebody in my lineup. I can't just make regular weekly transactions unless a player in my lineup either gets hurt, demoted, or I drop that player. So, and that that makes drafting Fernando Tatis kind of awkward. Yes. I mean, it, that's why you'll see on this draft board here for those watching, there are a lot of either hurt players currently or minor leaguers that were drafted. And that's strategically because it allows you more flexibility within your your transactions. You can put players in and out of your lineup then by, you know, once the season starts, player goes in the IL, all right? You have to take them out put them on your IL spot, and then you could put someone in your lineup. So there's a strategy factor to that, and I kind of wish I wound up with someone who was on the okay. IL to start the season, but... Uh, okay, so... So, yeah. So when Fernando Tatis comes back, you need to hope somebody else is hurt or demoted, right? Or, else or you just have to have him in your lineup the first two weeks. No, yeah, that's exactly it. Chris is right, because... Yeah. I mean, I guess I should have asked what happens with suspension, but I would imagine... Yeah. That, that probably, oh, they're on the roster right yeah, yeah. so, you but it, so it, it, it applies the other way too it's not just um this is your only opportunity to remove someone but this is your only opportunity to insert a new someone too yeah yeah, yeah. and and yeah. yeah there's it it factors into trading as well because if you trade for a reserve player then it, it it changes whether or not you can put that person in your lineup i'm making this more confusing than it needs to be but quickly my general strategy was to not spend more than 30 dollars on any player uh, wind up yep. with a 65%, 35% split, a uh, hitter pitcher split in terms of my uh, my budget and draft relatively boring high floor players who are going to play. Scott, you know this because you do the AL and NL only drafts on CBS every year. Yep. Paid appearances and innings are key. Playing time matters immensely in a format like that. So before I reveal my team, Scott, what did you think of my general strategy going in? Yeah, no, that's that's how I try to approach AL and NL only leagues too, and that's why I kind of made that um, that comparison to a 15 team roto league where you m I might have to treat them more similarly now with hitter being scarcer. Uh, but I, I didn't always do it that way, and I came to to realize, if, you know, once I came to realize a few years ago just how important it was to have playing time in your lineup, even if it's pretty blah playing time um once i made that adjustment which meant you know in the salary cap draft not not spending as much on the high dollar players because you don't want low dollar players low dollar players in an al and a lonely league are just probably going to be ones who aren't playing right uh so i i made that same adjustment you did 
generally speaking, I don't spend more than $30 on any player. I might go 31, 32 on somebody, but you know, it's a, it's a loose rule. Certainly not, you know, going 45, 50 on anybody. And once I made that adjustment, I started doing a lot better in these leagues. Like I, I, I think AL only leagues are the ones I'm consistently good at these days, which is hard <laughs> to do because obviously there's more, uh, Anytime somebody gets injured in a league this deep, it, it's a disaster. So it, it, you'd think it'd be more vulnerable to luck and it'd be harder to be consistent at it. But that, you know, that what you're saying, uh, really distributing the dollars more evenly makes a lot of sense. And I mostly accomplished my goals. I did have one mishap within the draft, which caused me to miss out on a few hitter targets, specifically at third base and my second catcher spot. So I wound up spending 62% on hitting, 38% on pitching, came up a little bit short there. Brace yourselves those listening or watching, if you do not play in AL or NL only, this is going to sound <laughs> awful. Here's my team. Sean Murphy, Tucker Barnhart at catcher. That's right, Tucker Barnhart. Reese Hoskins, Gene Segura, Francisco Lindor, Evan Longoria in the infield, CJ Abrams at middle, G-Man Choi at corner, and then in the outfield, I've got Christian Yelich, Lars Newbar, Charlie Blackman, Andrew McCutcheon, Mark Canna, and then Nelson Cruz at utility. Chris, you're up, man. Rip me apart. What do you think? Mostly boring guys, but I got I got my two upside plays in Lars New Bar and CJ Abrams. Yeah, no, I, I think it's fine because you know, going through it, it's hard to have everyday players in every spot in an NL only or AL only league, frankly. And I think you pretty much do outside of Evan Longoria and G-Man Choi probably. And then Nelson Cruz, we don't quite know, but I don't think he's gonna play every day. So yeah, I, I think in that regard, well, and Mark Hanna. So, yeah, you start adding up. But no, I, I think for the most part, it's a it's a good balance of getting a couple upside guys, getting mostly dependable starters. And like Christian Yelich is someone that I think sort of gets viewed as a, a boring low upside player. But I do still think because he's got pretty good plate discipline, the athletic skills are still pretty good. And he hit the ball really hard last season. So I do think there is room for a not a return to being a 50 homer 30 pace guy like he was at his best but like if Christian Yelich hits 25 home runs this season it wouldn't shock me and that would make your team a lot better yeah i mean basically i had players at each position i had a budget for each position so i knew for example my outfield one i was going to spend 18 to 20 dollars and it was mm -hmm. uh Christian Yelich Ian Happ and Chris Bryant and i think Bryant actually went for 17 so he actually turned out being a really good buy but I wanted players with similar skill sets at each position and then wind up with one of those players. So I give myself different options within the draft if someone's going cheaper, so on and so forth. So that was my plan. And, and for the most part, I really did stick to it. On the pitching side, my, my starters were Brandon Woodruff, Nick Lodolo, Carlos Carrasco, Ross Tripling, Hayden Wesneski, and Taiwan Walker. My relievers, I wanted one surefire closer. I spent up for Devin Williams, who's $21. And then I've got Scott McGuff, that name again, and Joe Mantz applies. So uh, each of those Diamondbacks relievers were one dollar each. If they combine for Look, you, if they combine for ten to fifteen saves, I'm ecstatic, Chris. That's all I need. You got like thirty percent of the potential closers for the Diamondbacks. <laughs> yeah, I took I took Kevin Ginkle in the reserve round too. So I <laughs> woke up. I wound up with the holy of uh, Arizona Diamondbacks relievers. Uh, Scott, what do you what do you think overall about the uh, the pitching staff here, and then any thoughts on the hitters? Well, I, I, I can mostly just compare it to the own my own NL only team I put together. Same, you know, salary cap league, twelve teams, all of that. Um, and, and there are a lot of similarities. I wish you had a better, um, uh, third baseman or corner infielder because you got yep. Evan Longoria and G Man Choi in those spots. And like, if one of those was somebody who I thought could be more than just there. Uh, I'd feel a lot better about your team. I don't know that I would have gone 18 on Sean Murphy. I feel like catchers aren't a great investment in leagues this deep because they're not for, for the amount of money you pay the run and RBI production won't be the same as if you devoted those dollars to another position. And in my own NL only league, I didn't go for a true ace like Brandon will Brandon Woodruff. Cause I think the mid tier is deep enough to compete in the pitching categories in this league. So I would have taken some of those dollars from Woodruff, the 28 there, some of those dollars from Sean Murphy, the 18 there, and probably uh, paid for another corner infielder 
and probably another outfielder too. But overall, I think uh, I think we're closer to the same mindset than not. Yep, yep. I, I agree completely. Third base and corner, those are not the guys that I had written down. That was when my like mid draft uh, issue was going on. So that's why it kind of messed things up for me. But um, I did wind up with someone in reserve, Scott, who you also drafted, who could turn out to be a big win specifically for third base and corner True. Christian True. Encarnacion strand of the Cincinnati reds. This guy is off to an amazing start in the, in spring training, 12 for 23 homers, 10 RBI, a 1700 OPS. Obviously it's a super small sample, I didn't think there was any chance, Scott, of him making the opening day roster. I would say that chance is at least 50% now. What, what are your yeah, thoughts so, on Encarnacion Strand? So C. Trent Rosecrans, who covers the Reds for The Athletic and has covered them for a long time for different publications. Um, he had an article about this in The Athletic the other day. And um, they were talking about potential replacements for Joey Votto, who d- doesn't look like he's going to be ready for the start of the year. Um, and Bell acknowledged that Encarnacion Strand is is part of that. You know, they, he, he hasn't spent a lot of time at Double A yet. Obviously, put up huge numbers in the minors, putting huge huge numbers this spring. But just he hasn't gotten a lot of upper level experience, and, and they're taking that into account. But this is the same organization, the same leadership uh, that you know, spring training a couple years ago, Jonathan India didn't look like he was in the discussion, and then suddenly he was the opening day second baseman. So Bell's saying that in Encarnacion strand could uh, f- follow in those footsteps. And um, I took him late in towers. He was one of those upside picks. I took late. I took him late in TGFBI too. It's one of my last couple picks. I think he is definitely a player who is gaining traction this spring. He's eligible at third base everywhere, which is great and considerable power, some plate discipline questions, but considerable power. All right. Well, that's my NL only labor team. Good luck to me because I haven't played in a mono league for a while. But again, the, the live in person auction, I mean, that is just fantastic. So I highly recommend it. Let's take one more break here. And when we return, we'll have a special guest here on Fantasy Baseball Today. Well, what do you think we're going to uncover out there? With some luck, maybe a green jacket as sharp as the one you get when you win the Masters. It's a tradition unlike any other. The Masters on CBS. So every September, our friends from the Fantasy Football Today crew put on their Draftathon event. It is a six-hour live stream giving out fantasy football advice and raising money for St. Jude's Children's Hospital. Last year, they auctioned off a bunch of fun experiences, and, and one of them was a guest experience, a guest appearance on this podcast. Please welcome in the other winner of that contest. He is Neil Shaw. Welcome to the show, Neil. What's going on, man? Hey, guys. Good evening. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Excited for it. Yeah, absolutely. So tell us a little bit about yourself, what types of fantasy baseball leagues you play in, maybe what team you root for, all that fun stuff. Yeah, I've been doing, you know, like rotisserie going back to the 80s. I'm almost 50 years old. So I've been playing since, you know, I was uh, probably 12, 13 years old. And um, I'm a lifelong Yankee fan. I'm I'm over (laughs) over 40 years. Uh, so uh, Donnie baseball was my guy growing up. Um, and, but I've been with, uh, in a league for over 20 years now with really close friends from, from growing up since, you know, elementary school friends, uh, middle school friends. And, um, it's an auction, uh, 12 team, uh, $260, uh, uh, draft. It's a, we have three, we have keepers. You're allowed uh, five keepers for up to three years. And um, at some point before we close, I do want to ask you a keeper question about my team. Get your perspective on that. But um, yeah, no, it's a very competitive league. Really good guys, but but very competitive league. A lot of fun. All right. Well, we're interested to get your perspective. And OG here playing fantasy since the 1980s. Yes. Yeah, you got any like fun uh... newspapers and and keep stats, you know, literally, but with pencil and paper every day. <laughs> yeah. newspapers I can't even imagine. Do you yeah. have any like fun uh, fun traditions? Because I'm in a league that's been I've been in this league for three seasons now this is going to be my third but the league itself has been running since the 80s yeah and they've awesome. got a tradition of like the winner we we do uh peter luger's steakhouse oh, night uh yeah. at the end of the year in like november and this is november in, in brooklyn so it's you know usually in the 40s the person who wins the league everybody at the draft party dunks uh bottles of yoohoo the <laughs> the chocolate i don't think there's actually any milk in that but 
you know, the chocolate flavored drink. The chocolate drink, right? Uh, so that that's our our fun. Uh, so I like that's what that league. I want to come in second. You know, like that's right. my goal. I don't I don't actually want to win that league. You win a lot of money for winning it, but I'm good with second. Second gets a decent amount of money too. That's fine. That's fine. Yeah. So no. Um, and again, I've been listening to you guys. Uh, you know, for for several years now, I listen on a regular basis and. It's just very enjoyable for me. It's it's very relaxing, and, and I, I'm I'm a, I'm a baseball nerd, so um, I, I love the stuff you guys talk about. My wife, not so much, but but she tolerates <laughs> yeah. it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I appreciate you bringing up the the tracking stats and pen and paper and newspapers and box yeah. scores. People don't know this. The way I got into fantasy was my dad was playing back in the '90s when he would have to like mail in his lineups. And, <laughs> You got to call people on the phone to make trades and all that kind of fun. Right, stuff. Exactly. Exactly. And, and that's how actually I became friends with these guys. I would be on the phone for hours at a time, you know, back when we were like seventh and eighth grade. And that's how we became lifelong friends. Yeah, exactly. And, and, I, and, yeah. and how I got exposure was he let me name the team. I would name the fantasy baseball team and then my dad would do all the work. So that's, that's basically fun. how I got introduced to it and and it was a ton of fun obviously to this day so what neil wanted to do is he has some players that either you know we haven't talked enough about or players that he has a different perspective on so we'll try and run through as many of these as possible uh and neil i want you to start with the hitting sleepers that you yeah. have outside of the top 300 who are those guys that you're looking at yeah no thanks and and i tried to come up with guys who have some track record where there's a reason to believe and and there's a change that's happened that's a reason to believe so the first guy is Adam Duvall, who's, you know, I think number 400 rank in, in CBS Sports. And obviously he's a guy who in 2021 had 38 homers, led the National League. In 2020, 2019, he was an 800, 850 to almost 900 OPS guy. And last year was obviously a very much a down season for him. What excites me, though, is he moved to uh, Fenway. Um, obviously, that's a stadium built, I think, for his swing as a, as a fly ball hitter, or as a dead pole hitter. Obviously, he's a righty. He's a gold glove type fielder. So he'll be playing center field, I think, on a regular basis. And, you know, in a small sample size at Fenway, only 18 at bats career, he has four homers um, and like a, a 1400 OPS. So I think he's a guy, again, he's out, he's, he's in, in the 400 ranking, so you can get him for free. And I think he's a 30 plus home run candidate on playing full time uh, again for the Red Sox and what I think is a very good lineup, actually. So that's the first one. Uh, the second one is um, Jared Walsh, who is, again, uh, obviously first base for the Angels, ranked uh, 326. So, again, so outside of the 300. And here, so his first full month as a major leaguer was in September 2020, September 2020. And and then this first three months of 2021, he was basically an all-star. So in those first four full months, I, I added it up, he had 29 homers and 84 RBIs. OK, in his first four full months as a pro. However, going back to 2019, he has this thoracic outlet syndrome issue and that reared its head in the second half of 2021. So his second half numbers of 21 were down and 2022 was a disaster uh, for him. Ultimately, he had to have surgery on that and he basically missed the rest of the season last year. He's come back, and, and this is an issue that affects basically, you know, um, your collarbone, you know, down to your ribs, uh, causes uh, shoulder and neck pain and numbness. So it's just really hard, obviously, to play. And um, but now he's had surgery on it. He says he's 100 percent healthy. Obviously, he's a starting first baseman for the Angels. And again, I think a really good lineup. So, you know, and he's a guy who has a track record. Um, so if he's healthy now, I think he's a potential big uh, contributor at first base who, again, is not even being drafted. Um, and then the third one uh, is Brandon Belt, who, again, uh, ranked outside of the top 300. Obviously, in 2020, 2021, you know, over the course of those two seasons, 475 at bats, he had 38 homers and 1,000 OPS. So it's not that far removed. And he's another one who, in 2022, he's had chronic knee issues. It pretty much saddled him all year last year, his power completely. He's talked about that. To the point that he ultimately had season-ending um, uh, surgery uh, to repair his knee. He says he's 100%. He obviously signed with the Blue Jays. And, and it's going to segue into my next idea that I want to talk about. But the Blue Jays have brought their, obviously, uh, outfield in, especially uh, for in the right center field power sort of gap uh, or alley, okay? 
Obviously, he's a left-handed hitter, so it's perfectly suited for him. They brought their fences in from 375 to 359. And I looked this up. I think that is actually the shortest porch in right center field in all Major League Baseball. So I think that is totally suited for a left-handed power hitter. And now that he's healthy, I think he's a guy who um, can, again, be a 30 home run hitter as basically, you know, a strong side or a potentially full-time DH um, or sub, subbing in a little bit of first base for the Blue Jays. So I'm, he's another guy who I'm really excited about. It's got three names there. Adam Duvall now with the Red Sox, Jared Walsh coming back from thoracic outlet syndrome and Brandon Belt now with the Blue Jays. Do you have any interest in any of these three guys, obviously in deeper leagues? I, I have talked about Duvall some as a deep sleeper for, for, um, for the reasons Neil mentioned. I, I mean, he, he, the home runs he hits are high home runs to the pole side. And, um, yeah, I mean, you, you can't ask for a better venue for Duvall than, than Fenway. Now, I, I mean, home runs are basically all he can provide if he's going to provide anything. But home runs are getting pretty hard to find at that stage of the draft. So I think I think that's a good call there. Um, there have been times when I've gotten excited about Brandon Belt. He hasn't debuted yet this spring coming off knee surgery. It doesn't sound like it's really an issue, but you know, it's become kind of this out of sight, out of mind thing. Did he, um, I closed the window. Did he, do you, do you have the tout wars draft up Frank? Did Brandon Belt get taken there? Cause that's somebody who, if, you know, if he is playing even semi-regularly in addition to the power that that's an OBP mm -hmm. source, that's yeah. something he's always excelled at. So that might be, can't use him in the outfield, unfortunately, but that might be somebody I'm looking to pick up if he didn't get taken. So yeah, he, went, he went in round 21 of a 15 team mm. league. Go ahead, Chris. Okay. I think Belt is like a really, really good AL only player this year, especially because like it's hard to see him getting enough plate appearances to, you know, get to 550, even just because he's going to need time off. There's always, you know, been injury issues with him. He's had a lot of concussion issues in his career as well as, you know, me. And I think he's had like plantar fasciitis as well. Um, but I've been wanting him to get away from San Francisco for a while, just because that's such a hard park to hit for power in it. It boosts your doubles and triples. So the, the overall effect isn't as great as you might think, but it's really hard to hit for power as a left-handed hitter there. I, I think even as a part-time player, it's not out of the question that he hits 25 homers in Toronto. So I, I think Brandon Belt, deeper, you know, 15 team league or someone that as the season's going on can be intermittently worth starting. But, you know, I think when you're drafting a full team for a 12 team league, mixed league, it's a little harder for me to get excited about him just because I do think there are going to be some playing time issues. I think Adam Duvall though, that, there might not be that much difference between him and Hunter Renfro. At no, exactly. I think he's he's a cheap Hunter Renfro. Exactly. Yeah, that yeah. that's the the comp that I would make. Where like, yeah. you're not. There, there, it's there's not probably a sure... thirty to forty points in batting average difference. Let's. Oh yeah. Let's not go yeah. crazy. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, well, Fenway's a great batting average yeah. park for for a lot of reasons. The the big hitters eye. It's a big outfield, not including the. Well, the it's a three three ten to left field. He can get plenty of doubles or singles yeah. off that off that monster. Yeah. So I, I do think. Like, yeah, he's probably going to be worse than Hunter Renfro, but at the end of the season, if they had similar numbers, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. All right, Neil, let's get into your bold yeah. predictions you sent me. Two yeah. games here, one of them including another left-handed Blue Jays hit. Exactly, exactly. So I'm high on this point. I think a fantasy winner is going to be Dalton Varsho. Obviously, he's well-known and, you know, et cetera. But I'm making a case that I think he could be a league winner, essentially. And the reason for that is the point I mentioned about uh, Toronto and, and, and that power alley and, and, and right center field. But also, if you look at his numbers, he's going to be playing full-time outfield. Uh, if you look at his numbers, he's a significantly better hitter as an outfielder than as a catcher, going back to his time in, in, uh, in Arizona, okay? Not only that, if you look at late last season, basically he had very little power at catcher, didn't run at catcher. In September last season, obviously playing full-time outfield, he had nine homers, eight stolen bases, OK, he's got uh, very high, obviously great speed. So I think he's a guy who is going to, as a full time outfielder, be a 30 uh, 30 player um, and and obviously with catcher eligibility. And I think that'll be the first time ever 
that you've had a catcher uh, as a 30-30 player, uh, to my knowledge. So that's one reason I'm very excited. I mean, we all know that Varsho is a great player, but I think um, right now he's ranked, I think, in the 50s and the number two catcher. But I think he could be a uh, a stellar, stellar uh, player this season. So I'm, I'm excited did, about him. Did you reply uh, to my survey? Saying no, Varsha could be a 30 30 catcher, okay. Because okay, yeah, somebody else said that. Uh, my survey I, on Twitter that it the results I'm gonna write about tomorrow, yeah, but no, I, I thought Pudge got there, he didn't, he had 35 25, so okay. just, just yeah. came up short. But, yeah. uh, Real Muto was only the second 2020 catcher ever following yeah. that that year that Pudge won MVP, yeah. yeah. I, the, the other one I was uh, gonna say is, um. Obviously, Bobby Witt, who's, uh, you know, ranked in the 20s, et cetera. I'm going to make a case. I think Witt could be a top five player this year. And and the argument I'm going to make is obviously Witt last year as a 21 year old, he basically only had one season in pro baseball prior to that. And and that was in double A and triple A. He played about 125 games. So you throw out the first month because, you know, Mike Trout's first month as a major leaguer, he had a 600 OPS, right? So you're just getting your feet wet. A um, lot of pressure on him, you know, standing ovation at first at bat in Kansas City. And the next four months, he basically averaged five homers a month and about five to six steals a month the next four months. And then in September, I just think he got worn out. He had never played that many games. Uh, he, you know, he's learning, you know, shortstop and, and third base at the big league level, flop, flip, flipping back and forth. So this off season, he added about eight pounds of muscle. Um, and I think the comp, and now he's entering his, his um, age 23 season. I think the comp to him is Trey Turner. Uh, and if you look at Trey Turner, his age 22 season, and then his age 23 season, they have very similar body types. They obviously have elite, you know, sprint speed. Uh, Witt actually has better, you know, stat cast numbers, even at this age than Trey Turner. So I think, and we know he's an elite player, but I'm just making a point that I think he has a chance to be a, you know, 30 homer, 25 to 30 homer, 35 to 40 steal guy at third base uh, with third base eligibility. And um, I think that would make him potentially a top five player in fantasy this year. Chris, I don't think we have to squint too hard to see those counting stats coming to fruition, right? 25 plus home runs. 40 steals Bobby Witt in terms of sprint speed one of the fastest players in the game mm -hmm. added some muscle in the offseason so yeah it wouldn't surprise me if he gets to mid-20s I think maybe the biggest issue I have with Witt is where does the batting average wind up obviously mm -hmm. he hit around 250 last year it's his first season he could he could and should take a ne the next step this year but I think that's probably my biggest question mark is the batting average for Bobby yeah, again my point is he he was he was only 22 years old and and again he first year in the bigs and if you look at most guys I mean that that's still a stellar first season as a as a player so I would expect him to improve pretty much across the board uh, with one year experience now. Yeah, the thing with Bobby Witt that I struggle with is like the plate discipline is not good, right? He strikes out actually not that much, 21.4 percent. He doesn't walk at all, so you know, but he's like he doesn't swing and miss all that much. So it, it's for me, it's more about like making better swing decisions, you know, chasing a little less swinging at pitches to hit a little more. Um, if you can make those changes, then I do think you're just going to see the whole game grow, right? It's not just mm -hmm. a strikeout walk thing. That's the kind of thing where picking better pitches to swing at means you're going to, in theory, make better contact. You're going to have a better batting average. I do think there's definitely, he's a player who, it whatever if there's growth it's likely to be exponential right it, it's likely to be a situation where if bobby wet gets a little bit better at a couple of things he's going to get a lot better at everything right because he's such a talented player that like that's why i, I wrote my, my piece today the i think i called it the players i have to draft at least once and bobby Witt wasn't on that list he probably should have been because that's that's one that I think the likeliest outcome is he probably disappoints a little bit at a, you know, late first round, early second round ADP. But if he hits, he's going to be really, really good. And that's the kind of player that you need at least some exposure to when you're talking about a portfolio view of fantasy baseball. We had two big Japanese players come yeah. over to the States this offseason. Masataka Yoshida with the Red Sox and Kodai Senga with the New York Mets. And Neil, you have some pred predictions on those two. Yeah. Okay. So I know you guys are a little bit down on Yoshida and, 
and I did some research on this, and it's interesting. Obviously, there's been a lot of Japanese imports to Major League Baseball, but there's only been a handful, believe it or not, of hitters. Mm-hmm. And, and they've been big name, of course, and Matsui and Ichiro and, of course, Otani. But then after those three, it's like Shogo Akiyama and Kaz Matsui. There's not a lot after those three. And, and of course, Seiya Suzuki. But no, there, there aren't a lot of good ones after those three. That's well, but there's none. Mean. There's virtually none. There's right. mostly pitchers. There's hitters you can count on less than two hands, basically. And <laughs> the interesting thing about the hitters is Otani is the only one who's come, you know, under the age of 25. Mm-hmm. He came at age 22, 23. Everybody else has come with basically nine years of pro experience in Japan. So they all come in their late 20s, including Matsui and Ichiro. And when they come, if you look at, for all these guys, their Japanese numbers to the U.S., they all have a detraction in OPS of about 150 to 200 points. Again, including Ichiro and Matsui. And so I'm just saying, like, if, if history holds, you should see that similar detraction for Yoshida, which he's a thousand OPS guy in Japan last year. He was... 980 the year before that, 966 the year before that. So if at 150 to 200 decline, that's still an 800 to an 850 type OPS player, which would put him in the ranks of what you saw from Tucker and Bichette and Guerrero last season. He's an OPS, I mean, on-base machine, a 440 on-base for the last three years, okay? He's playing again at Fenway Park, and he's going to be batting at the top near the top of the lineup. So he's going at 245, or that's where his ranking is, and I think that's a huge steal uh, where he's going to be a great source of uh, batting average, runs, um, uh, on-base percentage. So I, I'm quite excited about Yoshida, and I think that uh, he's very much underappreciated. So that's my argument on Yoshida. Yeah, a comp I would make would be like the 2021 version of Alex Verdugo, who's a pretty boring fantasy player, doesn't really get anyone excited, doesn't hit for home runs, doesn't steal many bases. That's probably the profile we're likely to see with Yoshida, but could be a good source of batting average, should be on base a lot. And Alex Verdugo was a top 100 player in 2021 in Roto League because he scored 88 runs, he hit 289. I could see a something somewhat similar outcome for, for him. And, and you know, Verdugo is someone who... I don't, this might be the very first time we've mentioned Alex Verdugo on this podcast since whenever he, we talked about him last year, but he's being drafted higher than Yoshida. If I'm correct, he's, yeah, 196. Yeah, I'm making a claim that I think Yoshida is going to finish up as a top 20 outfielder. That That's my prediction. I, 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 that's where I'm going with that one on Yoshida. I think he'll I, really surprise. I could see it more in a head-to-head points league where plate discipline matters so much. You lose points mm-hmm. for strikeouts. Obviously, you gain points for walks. I think in OBP formats, my problem with Yoshida is I just don't know if he's going to do enough power and speed-wise from a Roto perspective to be mm-hmm. that top 20 outfielder. And if it does happen, it's probably on the strength of batting average, scoring runs, and the fact that the outfield position just isn't very good. So right. Right. I, 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 like that, to me, is the path to it happening. But, Scott... I just I have skepticism on the power and the speed for Yoshida. Well, there is no speed. He's he's not going to steal any bases. Uh, he didn't do much of that in Japan either. So, um, the power was, you know, he, he had a couple. Yeah, he had some twenty plus homer seasons in Japan. It, it's obviously not a neat. Um, there's not like a simple formula you can apply to say how that's going to translate to the majors, but like nobody sustains the power that they had in Japan. Understandably, the venues are smaller. The ball is smaller. Uh, it's just a different environment, but I'm not counting on more than like double digit home runs from Yoshida. So it's really like, is he going to be helpful enough in the counting stats? I was a little more excited when it looked like he was going to bat lead off. Now they're saying probably cleanup is more likely. Um, so that's going to cost him some of those counting stats. Certainly he's not going to be a run scoring specialist the way he would have been at the top of the lineup, but could he be like a Jeff McNeil sort of batting average specialist or, you know, I've, I've made the, I've made the Alex Verdugo comp before as well. Um, somewhere in that range is what I'm expecting for Yoshida. Obviously there are more doubts because we haven't seen him actually do it, but that's that's how I've been approaching him. Are, but you're, do you think there's more power than I'm giving him credit for, Neil? 
No, I, I'm not. I agree with you. I'm not expecting a lot in terms of power. Although I do think the Fenway Park situation is a positive. You know, we haven't seen. Um, I think that that's a positive for him. Uh, the ability to pepper uh, the opposite field there um, and doubles. But I, I look. I my argument is going to be based on his ability to hit over 300. Um, mm-hmm. I do think that lineup is a strong lineup. You know, we talked about Duval, but I, I actually think it's a very deep and strong lineup. Turner ultimately getting back. Uh, you know, the shortstop, uh, but, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, Casas, for example, too, I, you know, Devers, of course, I think it's a good lineup. Um, you know, so I do think he'll have an opportunity to still score runs, even if he's batting cleanup and of course, driving in RBIs too. Um, so yeah, I'm not, I'm not counting on more than teens Homer for him, but I think, um, but I think you add it all up. And, and again, he's a guy that right now that, you know, is, He's probably not even in the top 50 outfielders. I mm-hmm. think he's a real value. So that's that's what I'm excited about. All right. Neil, yeah. let's wrap up with uh, some of these quick hitters that you have here. Yeah. You know, we've got a couple of minutes left. Um, yeah. Quickly run through some of these. Let me, yeah, quickly. Yeah, thanks. Um, so look, I think, you know, you guys were talking about Wander Franco. I, I totally agree with you. I, I think that he was plagued by injuries last season. I'm expecting a big, big season from Wander Franco. I'm actually expecting a big season from uh, uh, Jonathan India, where, if again, he was also played by injuries uh, last season. I think Stephen Kwan um, is going to have a much better season. He's going, I think, 110 right now, and I compare him to Cedric Mullins at 36. I'm expecting Kwan to have a season that's around 25 to 30 stolen bases, um, north of 100 runs. If you look at what he did in the second half last season, 14 steals. He's obviously a terrific batting average guy, and I think that Cleveland lineup is – Quite strong, obviously, with the addition of uh, of uh, the first baseman um, and just uh, overall depth there. I think Andres Jimenez. Um, I actually compare him to Jose Altuve. I know uh, most of you guys uh, maybe don't feel that way, but but his numbers are comparable if you look at you know things like um, uh, exit velocity, hard hit, sprint speed, etc. He's only 23 years old. I look at him making a jump like similar to what Altuve did from his age 23 to age 24 season. So I'm expecting Jimenez to actually be even better this season. And uh, so I'm expecting uh, strong production there. I think Ahmed Rosario is a 35 to 40 steal guy this series on a contract season. That's his biggest value. And I think obviously he wants to get paid. So I'm, I'm expecting a lot there. I think uh, Corbin Carroll is Mookie Betts 2.0. They're almost identical in terms of body type, in terms of what they did in the minors. And in terms of what they did in the first 100, 200 at bats in the major league, so I expect a big, big season from Corbin Carroll. I think Gunnar Henderson's David Wright 2.0, similar, uh, identical uh, stats uh, in the minor leagues, identical at the age 21 season, identical body type, um, obviously a top prospect. I think Gunnar Henderson could have a David Wright type age 22 season, which was 27 homers, st- uh, 17 stolen bases. So I think a lot of value there. And then I think um, a couple of values on the pitching side. I think uh, Justin Steele, if you look at his second half last season, 36 innings, sub one ERA, 11 and a half strikeouts per nine innings. I think he's getting very little credit. Uh, he's, I think, going 374. Uh, he's, they added, um, obviously, Bellinger and, uh, and the uh, shortstop. So I think their defense will be better uh, in Chicago to help him. And, um, you know, real deep sleepers, Kyle Bradish, who, is going, I think, almost 800, so not even being drafted. In the last seven starts of last season, he had 23 scoreless innings versus the Houston Astros and the uh, Cleveland Guardians. So I think he's a guy with a much better team, going back to Gunnar Henderson and, and uh, Rushman, for example, um, that I think is a real value. So these are just some quick hits I wanted to throw out there. And sorry, one more is Kode Senga. I think he is Masahiro Tanaka. If you look at his stats in Japan, they're almost identical to Tanaka playing for the match, good lineup, good bullpen, uh, number three or number four pitcher, so easier matchup. So I expect uh, Kode Senga to have a very nice uh, Tanaka-like season, the Tanaka's first season as a Yankee. So I, I'm expecting a lot from Senga as well. I think as long as Kodai Senga could throw strikes, I mean, that with that fastball, 96-97, the ghost fork, we know that uh, when Tanaka was great uh, for fantasy, it was a lot of that splitter usage. So, you know, right. pretty similar pitchers there. Uh, a meta Rosario, 30 to 40 steals. I love to hear it. I, I don't know if Scott could say the same thing. So, <laughs> no, you know, no. Scott. I mean, I've, I've had that. Uh, he's so fast. He always seems like he, uh, un, for his whole career, it seemed like he underperformed as a base dealer. And so, he, you know, you're right. And I looked this up as a Met. He led the league twice and or maybe once, but maybe twice and caught stealing. He was not a good base dealer with the Mets. Uh, he had to learn that. But with the Guardians, he's, 
It's been very efficient. For 35. So he's gotten yeah. better as the guardian. And again, he's got to get paid. And that well, his calling and, card is going to be steals. And as we've talked about, it's a lot easier to steal bases. Exactly. It's, it's, exactly. It, the the league wide percentage of success is going to go up, and Rosario should benefit from that. All right. Well, Neil, it was a pleasure having you on Thank the podcast you here. Your expertise, your years of experience playing <laughs> baseball, and of course, we really do appreciate your uh, your contribution and your donation to St. Jude. So, thanks again, man. We really appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Pleasure to meet you all, and thanks for having me. And appreciate the time. We enjoyed it. Yeah. Yeah, great job from Neil there. We're going to wrap there for Scott, Chris, and Neil Shaw. I am Frank. Thank you all for listening and watching Fantasy Baseball today. We'll be back again tomorrow. Bye-bye.